lecture, many of you will see them in class next week, so you need to worry about that, and all summer too. But it's a chance um, to really share the um, research that Alan has been um, so lovingly and dutifully working on for these many years about Jack London, and so it should be a really lovely evening. So we're here both to celebrate Professor Alan Whitmar's 46 years of service to the University of Southern Maine, and to hear all about Jack London's dubious parentage. Um, <laughs> the title of the lecture, and I brought the written note for the title because I couldn't remember it because it is a true title of 19th century historian, <laughs> many colons. Never the twain shall, or indeed did meet, an Ellsworth main tale of the insensible relationship of a father, the controversial Chicago astrologer William Cheney, 1821 to 1903, and his son, the famous California author Jack London, 1876 to 1916. After Professor Whitmore's lecture, please stay and join us for cake. And without further ado, uh -huh. we, we hope we're just going to put an outline on the board. <laughs> <laughs> You're taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> um, years ago, when I was at a high school reunion in Orono, uh, the uh, moderator asked each one of us to stand and talk a bit about ourselves. And so I indicated that I was trained and accustomed to teaching for two and a half hours and one and a half hours. And immediately they suggested perhaps we could move on to someone who might have a little bit more brevity. So that would be the situation today. Um, a lot of my work here at USM is focused around the relationship of religion, uh, nativism, and government in the 19th century, coupled with the immigration. And as it turned out, when I first came back, I stumbled upon the fact that one of the major areas where an expression of this tension arose was up in Hancock County, particularly in the county seat of Ellsworth. And again, stumbling on the figure of a man named William Cheney, who was the editor of a local paper. And then, as life goes on, as in many of your own individual subjects, layers develop like an onion and new offshoots appear. Uh, the one that I'm speaking about tonight is something of an offshoot from my, uh, my general major work, but the joy I find in it is that it reveals the way in which the individual experience comes through. Uh, some of you are familiar with the work of, of Professor Clifford Geertz in anthropology with reference to the way in which the looking in density at individual matters like greetings of people and celebrations and activities can be very revealing. And so this type of of concern has kind of come to be expressed in what I'm going to be talking about tonight. So as the title indicates, there are really three major units tonight. I'm focusing around the community in particular of Ellsworth in the larger Hancock County and in the larger uh, uh, Mount Desert Island. But coupled with that, other aspects of Maine. But the other two features are two rather interesting individuals a man by the name of William Cheney, and the other, obviously, the novelist Jack London. Uh, last October, uh, my daughter Susan, who's here and is humoring me tonight, as it were, accompanied me out to, to, uh, to Berkeley, where I gave a paper that this is an extension of here, but it was at the Jack London Society, and the thing I found interesting was basically two things. One, just about everybody at the conference but the two of us we're, we're from west of the Mississippi. A lot of London buffs, they're almost all Westerners. And the second thing was, almost everybody comes through Cheney through London, whereas I come in at the reverse. Uh, Libby has, has typically in her graciousness, exaggerated my mastery of London. I, what I know of London pretty much comes through my man Cheney. So without that, uh, with further ado, with, with further, is that what say, is that what without further ado, so with further ado, let's get started in that respect. Uh, in October of 1905, Jack London set out on what he called his first, last, and only lecture tour. And it all had begun about a year earlier. 
uh, in October of 1904, when a knock came at his, res his two-story residence in Oakland, came to answer the door and facing him in an ingratiating, smiling manner uh, was a man by the name of Harry Fuller, who explained that he was an agent of the uh, Slayton uh, Lyceum uh, Bureau, which operated out of Chicago and was the leading uh, leading organizer of lectures and music performances in the United States. And the person approached uh, London and wanted to know, have you ever considered going on a lecture tour? And, Cheney, and London immediately said, no, he hadn't, for three major reasons. First, he said, I'm a writer and not a speaker. Secondly, he said, I basically need time to do my writing. And third, I can do much more, I can earn much more money writing than I can speaking. <laughs> but the lecturer, but the agent said basically that you are forgetting the following, that people don't want to have trained lecturers, they want to be in the presence of celebrities, as it were. They want to see somebody and to be close to them and kind of figure them out. London at the time was the most popular and one of the four or five best paid uh, authors in America in the early 19, in 1900, 1910 type of period. And what was more, they said, it can't hurt you to have a little bit more public exposure and the like, even though London had been particularly successful in promoting his works up till then. Well, London was rather averse to accepting this idea, but he wasn't, but circumstances made it interesting for him to consider possibly uh, pondering the matter a bit more. About six months earlier, he had separated from his wife, and for the moment, he had significant payments to support his wife and two young children, two daughters, uh, Joan and Becky. Uh, secondly, he had his own residence to support. A divorce seemed to be pending, so that would be more. Beyond that, his mother and a kind of step-nephew of his who lived with his mother had to be supported, and other family matters too, that he was, had an enormous number of expenses. So he said he wasn't going to make anything for sure, but to go forward and so forth. Well, it turned out that Fuller was speaking more than he really had authenticity and, gen and genuineness to do, that he was no longer a part of the Slayton concern, but he brought it to them. Slayton people took over, and over the next three or four months, negotiations went back and forth. And finally, in January 1905, it was decided, an agreement was made, a contract was made, that London agreed that beginning in, the, uh, in October of 1905, about nine months from then, he would go on a lecture tour, somewhat interrupted around Christmas time for a month, uh, because he had work to do, but also expectations of a second marriage would come soon. <laughs> and that was a factor, and, and so on. So he was going to go forward with his work while the company began to promote other things. So over the next five or six months, London, as a reflection of his personal nature and his interests, uh, went forward in his career of writing on a regular basis. It was London's experience, even when he, a person of enormous generosity to people, even when he had visitors, it was understood that London would arise around 6 o'clock in the morning and for the next six hours he would devote himself to his, his writing or beyond that, whatever it took to develop as his favorite saying was, a thousand words edited and typed, as it were. Uh, customarily, like Ben Franklin, he slept about five and a half hours a day and he was enormously religiously devoted to his craft. Um, notice. He's born in 1876. He dies in November 1916 at 40 years of age, having produced 53 books since 1890. In a 17-year period, he would produce some 53 books, of which 22 were novels, 12 were nonfiction. The rest were collections of his works. He had 189 short stories. He was, among other things, an extremely disciplined writer in that respect. But beyond that, he had many other interests. He loved to fly kites, he loved to fence, he loved to box, he loved to swim. He was very much into athletics in a, in, in a major way. And beyond it, he was a very active figure in the San Francisco Bay Area community of writers and artists and others, uh, as, as it were. 
So over the six or seven months that followed that, together with the factor that he was a very much a committed socialist, and he gave a number of lectures locally as he had done, but one other factor. We all know from our in introductory works and the like about Upton Sinclair's book, The Jungle. Well, Upton Sinclair, about 26 years old then, uh, who had gone to NYU and graduated from Columbia, had determined to start what was called the, inter the International Intercollegiate Socialist Society. He felt that in college, his college education had been very good, but there had been very little address of modern issues of social and economic and political work. And so his hope was to try to attract people to, to have a chance of studying, not necessarily committing themselves to socialism. So in 1904, he had sent letters out for people to join him. London was the one who accepted. And it turned out in, in, in September of 1905, just one month before London goes on, the, on, on, on his tour, uh, in September, he is voted in a New York City organizational conference where he was not present. Upton Sinclair nominated him for president, believing that he was the most visible figure uh, and, and would be helpful to promote the movement. And so London was saying that on this lecture tour, he would, he would participate in that. Okay. And finally, two more things in the summer. One, he had become increasingly fond of a woman named Charmian Kittredge, who in a moment would become very significant, as we'll see in terms of the topic tonight. And so she and her step-parents, living about 40 miles north of San Francisco in what's Sonoma County, um, basically in a very beautiful area, Susan and I came to see when we came to visit the Jack London Ranch last, last uh, fall, uh, he, he was uh, spending time with her, but was also looking for a place to develop a, 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 a place of his own, that his early years had been, in many ways, kind of in, kind of, uh, difficulty, stress, he had never had really a long-term home, uh, scarcity and income and life had been present in his early years, and he was looking for some place that would provide some, some basis of order, and he was looking for some property that he might find that would be close to San Francisco, but be out of town, and, and that's Sonoma County, about 40 miles north of there, was, he was going to be looking for that. Well, amidst these activities, in July of, of 1905, a letter came to him from Brunswick, Maine, uh, the secretary of a women's literary group and kind of uh, community betterment group called the Saturday Club of Brunswick, um, where it had seen the, the, the publicity about London's tours. People were signing up for him to give lectures and the like. And, and somebody, and so the secretary of the club was saying, would you be willing to come to Brunswick to lecture? And he shows the, the, uh, the letter to Charmian, his fiance. And Charmian was extremely excited for the following reason. Charmian's late father had been born in 1829 in Bar Harbor, uh, in what was, well, what was then called West Eden. Eden was the original name to, for Bar Harbor until, until in 1916 it was formally changed. But even, even up to that time, Bar Harbor was sometimes used. And the point is, her father, Willard Kittredge, in 1829 had been born in uh, Bar Harbor. And around 1849 or 50, around in there, uh, he became one of the followers of the 49ers going west for the gold rush. Uh, so he goes west to California, he eventually marries out there, and basically uh, Charmian was born in 1871. Her father dies in 1886. The point is the family had been very close to an enormous number, probably two dozen or so relatives of, the, of Kittredges and Gilpatricks and others who lived up in Mount Desert Island or between Ellsworth and Bar Harbor and that whole area in that region. And so she said to him, look, you're going to be going on a lecture tour in October. We're waiting for your final divorce. We kind of agreed that when that comes, we will marry and it's the tour. Wouldn't it, would, would you like to come up to see my relatives with whom she didn't much in contact. In fact, she spent four months in, uh, in, in, Mount, in Mount Desert Island in 1900 
and, and when on part of a tour she's making in the East Coast and Europe and then coming back there as well and she kept up contact with our pine tree area down eastern and so he said sure he'd be glad to and so they follow up on this and it's finally determined that in December the uh, December the uh, 7th uh, a Thursday an appointment is made that he will give one of his lectures on his tour up at, at uh, in Brunswick Several of the ladies of the Saturday Club were married to professors at Bowdoin or to administrators, and so Bowdoin College rather graciously offered the use of Memorial Hall, one of their bigger halls still up there, uh, for that meeting, and the expectation that a large crowd would come to turn out, and so forth. So, in October, uh, on the 22nd, London uh, boards a train in Oakland, accompanied by his servant, the Korean Min Yungi, uh, whom he had basically hired when London was a war correspondent in the Russo-Japanese War. And Min Yungi was a Korean from the, uh, from the uh, area of Seoul and had been tremendous in his assistance to London. Of course, this becomes very interesting in later years. They have articles about the socialist with a servant and all that, you know, kind of thing. You know, he liked to travel well, you know, kind of, you know. But, but also, he, uh, he emphasized, in, in his, his own sense, the enormous skill of Man Yungi and how his feeling was there's nothing that is servile about being a servant, and he tended to pay him well, treat him very well. And, and, and Min Yungi, for his part, was extremely helpful to him and eventually to Charmian and was a great favorite with his daughters, as it were. So, in October, he and Min Yungi start off. Um, the, con the negotiations with the company had been such that the understanding was for the first 10 lectures, he would get $75 per lecture plus expenses and the coverage of his servant's fee. Uh, because of some stuff I'm doing, the very fascinating entry in the internet on the value of the dollar in American history. And at least what one finds is about $75 then would be approximately maybe about $1,900 to $2,000 a lecture now, something like 25 to 1 in terms of value at that point. And I should have mentioned that by in July, before this time, he had found a property he'd been seeking, some 130 acres that significantly he had to put down within two weeks $6,600, which using that same calculation, depending on how you value real estate, was somewhere between 183 uh, to about a million dollars. I mean, London is a very successful author. But the point of the matter is a lot of the people who are far more knowledge than I in London as a writer say that his excursion into property, and this is just the beginning, Eventually, the London ranch is about 10 times as large. Uh, in fact, in the last two or three years, it's been made part of the California State Park System. And when we were out in October, one of the alarms was that, you know, the financial condition of California, that some thought they may be shedding some of their, their more expensive state parks and all that kind of thing. In any event, in October, they start off. His tour saw him become extremely popular with newspapers and others. One of the qualities, whether you're a big London buff or not, I'm not particularly so, but one of the things one finds very striking and pleasing about him is he's enormously generous. Uh, there are this, a book and then a revised, rather completely different book about London's correspondence with young writers or amateurs seeking help. And, and, and you know, he's, it's, it's one of the rather plays, he really goes out of his way to help people that way. And the other thing is, in his ranch, he basically welcomed anybody traveling, drove his wife up a wall, which is interesting in terms of vertical climbing and all that kind of thing. But, I mean, people just stayed and stayed and stayed. You know, you know the generosity of an old southern planter, as it were, in that respect. But two things of a negative type hit London on the tour that hurt him in, in public image. One of them was, in one of his early speeches, he used the phrase, to hell with the Constitution. <laughs> and newspapers jumped on that, already as a socialist, seen as a rather radical figure anyway. But they saw this as London's point of view. Whereas, as he tried to emphasize, the reality was that that phrase was uttered, said he, 
by the, uh, by the general in charge of the Colorado National Guard when they were suppressing a labor strike of miners in Colorado. Actually, London was wrong, newspapers were wrong, it was actually a junior officer. But the point of the matter was London protested and no one really believed him, but, it, but he was really recording, was part of his criticism, what he felt the establishment was insensitive to the worker and all. But the reality was it harmed him politically. And the second thing was the growth of the following. On Friday, November the 17th of 1905, uh, 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 Bessie, uh, mad in London, received the official divorce decree. And two days later, uh, and basically two days later, he, uh, uh, Jack London, invited his fiancee Charmian. He asked her to travel from Newton, Iowa. She had gone to live soon after he had gone. She had gone east to live with a high school friend, uh, Lynette McMurray, and her husband Will, uh, so that she would be somewhat in the Middle West when, if, and when that occurred. And so she comes to Chicago, they marry within 24 hours, and it hits the newspapers, this insensitive oath for crying out loud divorce <laughs> one wife, and two days later, you know, he's in the bullpen winding up for the second, as it were. And the result was a lot of women's and civic clubs all over the country basically uh, uh, demanded his books be removed from the library and the like, and so on. Well, after the marriage, spending about a week with the McMurrays, but then he comes to Maine. And uh, uh, leaving uh, Iowa on the 5th, he basically goes on the 6th to Chicago, immediately boards the Lakeshore Limited, goes to Boston, gets off. It's a, it's a winter New England day, December 6th. And so early in the morning, they hustle over and get some gloves and warm hats <laughs> and things. And then they, they take the uh, Boston and Maine Railroad up to Brunswick, going passing obviously through Portland on four hours. And the result is the beginning of three and a half days in Brunswick. On all of the other 41 lectures that he gave, on 40 and 41 he would commonly arrive in a speaking engagement in the afternoon. He would be greeted by his host and hostess he would go to the lecture, he would have, they would have an affair afterward, a, a, a greeting of the people in the community. He'd go back, get to sleep, and then rise and go on the train the next day. Brunswick was unique. Uh, he stays there three days. Um, the women of the Saturday Club went all out to entertain him, to travel him around Brunswick. Uh, two fraternities held social uh, activities for the, the, the Londons. And uh, Charmian in her diary, which is very helpful, uh, indicates what a joy it was and how kind the people were. Um, the, the president of Bowdoin at that time is one of the key figures in education in Maine, William DeWitt Hyde. He was a 47 years old in 1905. He had come to Bowdoin at 26 years of age as a minister from Patterson, New Jersey. At a time in the 1880s when Bowdoin's endowment was down, uh, the school was kind of in decline, and like a one-man ba one band, as we like to say, kind of the way I say it so articulately, uh, he proceeded to build up the endowment to hire excellent faculty to engage students and to become a vital figure in the classroom. He was a dynamo there and a very much a defender of the role of liberal arts college, small colleges in, in the role of education. And he took a great shining to, to London, uh, hosted him around, took him around to different things. And as it turned out, London gave his first reading of basically a magazine series that he had just sent off his first, he was the first in a series about 12 authors and prominent Americans who basically were going to address the issue of the purpose of my life. London's was a huge hit, it was considered the best of the whole series. It had its maiden run in Bowdoin. And, and, and the faculty came out and there were discussions and the like. So for three days he's there on Saturday, uh, December the 9th. Uh, they have a final buffet with the, 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 the uh, faculty and with the Saturday club. He, and he's a professional level photographer down in our library. There's a, 
very attractive book about London as a photographer, and he took his last photographs of Brunswick and also of what was called the Cabinet Cotton Manufactory, kind of typical New England mill. He is a socialist worker, very concerned about that. And so on Saturday, they take the train north from Brunswick to Bangor, some four hours, immediately at 4.30 arriving. They get on the train at 5, and, 30, and, and, and one hour and 10 minutes later, they get off at Ellsworth, Maine, 30 miles away. He, they are greeted by, uh, by, um, by uh, uh, Charmian's second cousin, uh, basically uh, Julia Taylor, who was the operator of the chief bookstore and stationery store in Hancock County. She greets them. Uh, they and Manyungi, uh, you know, have kind of a, they're met and, and treated at the American House the next day. Through the first driving snowstorm of the season, <laughs> they travel by sled. Jack London just loving it. He's never been in a snowstorm <laughs> of that quality. Of course, we're all in the But, uh, but Miss uh, Miss Thompson, uh, Thompson's Island is the island that connects, that is the, the area where Mount Desert Island and Ellswood, kind of Ellswood, 10 miles away, it's where the island begins. And so they stay there. And over the next week, from December the 9th to the 16th, they spend time with about 24 to 28 relatives that live on the island. So for a week, through with sleighs going back and forth, there's a series of snowstorms. They visit, it's the off season even then for for, for Bar Harbor as a vacation area. They enjoy seeing the Atlantic and all. And then it comes to the 16th. Jack has to go back onto the road to renew his tour. He is billed to be in Boston for the next week where he speak at Harvard and a couple of engagements in the city and other areas. So the, the, the evening of the 15th and 16th, Friday to Saturday, was the coldest night of the year, some 17 below zero in that area. But they brave it, they go back, they board the train and go back from, from this train area near this island. They stop, the train stops at Ellsworth. They get up at Ellsworth to see if Julia, her second cousin, will be there. Standing on the platform, they look for her. She hasn't arrived, they're back on the train, they're in Boston, they're up to Bangor take the evening meal in Bangor and take the, e the evening express to Boston and so on. So, December 1905. So we go back 53 years before then. 53 years to the place where that station is. And we find another stranger coming to Ellsworth in 1852. His name is William Cheney. William Cheney was from Chesterville, Maine, which is up near Farmington. <clears throat> he had been born in 1821, had grown up in a middle, in a middle class farm family with his father's 1,400 acres of, of land was much larger than the average land holding in Maine at the time. But in his hopeful, he, he's a rather bright young lad hoping to go to college even at that age. But then his hopes are shattered in January of 1830, when he's nine years old, his father and a neighbor were going to take a sled some 30 miles to Augusta. Augusta, that peculiar place that some of us frequent here in Maine, as it were. And the problem was basically he driving the sled, basically the sled hit a rock and started to turn over. The other person jumped off, uh, let, uh, Cheney's father tries to get in control of the sled. He's able to manage to drive it into a, another farm yard, but in the process, it tips again. He jumps out, but in the process, the reins have twist, twisted around his leg, and his head hits a stone, he dies immediately. Transforming William Cheney's life. Uh, his mother was then pregnant with their sixth child, she is overwhelmed with the prospect of keeping the farm going and maintaining other matters. So in the custom of the 19th century, Cheney and a nephew uh, of the family who had been taken in in the custom of that day to kind of help out when families in disarray, the nephew and Cheney are put out to live with relatives. And over the next seven years, Cheney lives with six different families. 
all of him either physically or emotionally abuse him or completely neglect him. A rather brutal enterprise, including getting beaten up, kicked around, as you will see in a moment. Uh, Cheney becomes bitter about the whole situation and determined, basically becoming a ruffian, beating up his fellow young people at the time, but determines he's going to be the worst pirate that ever lived. That's his plan, and get to New Orleans where the pirate life will take over. And so he enlists in the Navy, and then a year later, deserts from the Navy, you know, feeling he wasn't learning the proper skills, and furtively, furtively makes his way uh, uh, furtively toward New Orleans. He goes traveling at night, you know, being almost more perhaps suspicious than he had to be in those days of lacking of drones and other matters to track one and the like. He, he uh, basically goes uh, westward through New York, through northern Ohio, the Ohio Canal down to the Ohio River, and suddenly he's beset by a severe fever. Uh, the, he had hired aboard a flatboat, hoping to make his way gradually down to New Orleans. But basically, uh, the, 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 the captain just puts him uh, uh, off the ship. Local people nurse him back to health. He teaches school a bit and go up to Wheeling in Virginia, not West Virginia. And he goes there, reads law, and let's say finally, around 1846, when we have him at 25 years old, after being admitted to the Virginia bar, he travels west as many people in the Ohio Valley, Wheeling, Cincinnati, Louisville were, he travels out to the Mississippi River and gets off and goes to Burlington. Rather interestingly, on the way, uh, meeting the, 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 the uh, Mormons who are moving west to try to escape for freedom, he experiences observing seeing them. He sees this very significant the discipline organization they have. So he spends five years in Burlington as a young lawyer, uh, outsider, but you begin to see the qualities of Cheney. He loves discussion groups. He has a very imaginative mind. He speaks well. He loves the interplay of ideas that such voluntary groups have that so many groups in my senior seminar have been dealing with in the form of the public lecture forum of the 19th century. <laughs> and then seemingly a major help comes to him in 1851. He's 30 out in the, in the Mississippi Valley in that first he's chosen to become the city attorney for Burlington and secondly about two weeks later he marries Jane Anna McGarry and seemingly suddenly his life is just taking advanced form but it lasts two months uh, suddenly she comes down with cholera which was epidemic in the Ohio Valley and Mississippi Valley at the time she dies two days after she is diagnosed and a month later, he's basically fired from his job for apparently a land transaction as a lawyer he hadn't done successfully. So in 1851, kind of bereft of everything, he decides to go back to Maine. He hasn't been there for 10 years, hasn't seen his mother and his sisters live in the Bangor area, roughly speaking Bangor and Eddington, places like that. And on the way, he stops to confront one of his former guardians. And now this fellow, probably well off beyond middle age, however we define that, and then one who had beaten him up, and so Cheney proceeds to just lash out at him and beat him up after he had Cheney experience being kicked in the side as a youngster before. Revenge was Cheney's game, and a great memory as well as a speaking element, as it were. But in Bangor, in the area, he learns there's a job open for a junior attorney in Ellsworth. He goes and makes a contract with a crusty lawyer named Charles Lowell. And that brings him thus in 1852 in Ellsworth, where for the next six years he, he, uh, he lives. The law partnership broke up after two months. Neither one of them basically could get along with the other. They're both very stubborn. Lowell probably more responsive with this than even the Cheney. Cheney tries to work as an independent lawyer, doesn't do much there, finds a job clerking in a general store. I don't know precisely, but I have some ideas where it would be, as I will mention in a moment. But he participates in these lecture and discussion groups in Ellsworth, and as a result, the publisher of a, of a weekly newspaper known as the Ellsworth Herald in Ellsworth 
which is obvious, whereas the elves of the air are going to be published by the courts. <laughs> you know, that's the kind of that's the kind of thing students pay seven hundred dollars for. Is Julia Roberts. You know, that's the insight. Nobody take notes. It's embarrassment galore. I see Libby coining a kind of devastating critique up here. So, okay, what are we going to do? You know, beginners luck. In any event, he he is approached by the editor of this paper that's struggling. And, or as Willie Joe Namath would say, struggling, as it were. And so he becomes the editor of the Ellsworth Herald for the next several years. His years on the Herald are noteworthy first for much controversy. The, the byplay, the one-upsmanship of rival newspapers at the time, Cheney couldn't easily accept in a peaceful way, so he gets involved with major feuds. Second thing is that the paper is struggling and the publisher is concerned that Cheney is not becoming aggressive enough when a religious issue arises in Ellsworth as it's arising all over the country. And that is, about the same time that Cheney in April 1853 accepts the paper position, there was a traveling to Ellsworth to set up a religious base was one of the early Catholic Jesuit missionaries in Eastern Maine. John Baptist, B-A-P-S-T. If you're from Eastern Maine, you, you know John Baptist is equivalent kind of the shepherds of Eastern Maine in that respect. Well, basically, uh, and of course, uh, at Boston College, my, my chair is noticing that very well. Yes, we affirm first president of Boston College and all that. Okay. So the point of the matter is Baptist is a kind of uh, a beater in terms of activity of serving his flock, traveling through much of the state of Maine, Bangor and Augusta and Portland had their independent priests, but beyond that it was mostly missionaries in the entire state of Maine where the interstate and, and airplane system was not particularly developed very well at the time. But every weekend he would pretty much come back to Ellsworth. And just as it was happening all over the country, you have a rising Irish immigration, a developing self-consciousness and sense of, you might say, Catholic pride, and Irish pride, Father Baps becomes the catalyst, the kind of Martin Luther King in kind of leading his people forward. And in the fall of 1853, uh, after his April arrival, six months later, he presents a petition to the school board. The petition saying first that there was a demand that the Catholic population have a right for their children to read the Douay the New Testament, the Catholic New Testament version of the Bible, when the, when the King James Protestant version was being read in the schools. You see movements like this all over the country. Uh, Archbishop John Hughes, or Cardinal Hughes in New York, being the, the major leader in this type of movement. And the petition said that if that isn't permitted, then there would be no Bible reading at all. Well, this was on top of issues like cultural strains, competition for jobs, concern about newcomers, what might be the effect on politics and government control in the area. So the school issue becomes the issue around which these other matters develop. Cheney, as the editor of the paper, basically says, people of Ellsworth stay calm. In 1844, as some historians know, or hysterical people know, Philadelphia was divided by major religious riots. And he said, let's be careful, nothing good happens in debating and arguing over religion. But this was a time when the so-called know-nothing, the nativist movement, was growing strong in the Northeast. And his publisher wanted him to take, become involved and pressured him. And finally, on the last day of 1853, he delivers a very vicious editorial attacking local Catholics as being part of sort of pawns of an international Catholic conspiracy operating out of Rome and, 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 and areas in the, in the kind of the Know Nothing movement as, as it's called in, in the country. And it launches him opportunistically seeing the way pressures are building. He immediately becomes a ma the, the most significant anti-Catholic leader in the state of Maine. In Hancock County, one of its strongest areas. Uh, the, the, the late uh, 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 president of the Maine Historical Society and, and former Superior Court Justice from, from Ellsworth informs me that 
where the know-nothings were strong in the 1850s, the Ku Klux Klan in the 1920s and 30s would be very strong along the coast, a like very kind of similar time. And so in January through, through May, really, Cheney is a one-man band. He, he is, his, his editorials and newspaper comes out every Friday. He holds rallies in Ellsworth. Uh, but he also is invited all over Mount Desert Island to speak to the locals. He be, he's not a member of a local vigilante group known as the Cast Iron Band, but he's a strong advocate of this group. Rather interestingly, if you know a little bit the anthropology area, in many ways the Cast Iron Band is what we might call a local example of the Sharivari, that in many pre-modern or pre-industrial or pre-capitalist societies, one finds a sense of introducing discipline and control through what we might say is sort of mob activity or gang activity, but it's seen as a very common type of institution in that area. And Ellsworth seems to have had, uh, been involved in that. Well, while all of that was going on, one other, another issue was coming to conclusion. And that is, when Cheney was new to Ellsworth a couple of, a year or so, in 1853, he become kind of one of mutually attracted to a woman named, named basically Mary uh, Ann, Mary Ann Jordan. Uh, she was a 19 year old, very troubled about her parents seeming to control her too much. She writes a, a poem to the Camden newspaper kind of saying basically, uh, mom and dad, I'm loyal to you, but I need freedom. I want to be free while yet I may before adult problems descend upon me. Well, they become very close, and while the, uh, the know-nothing activities of Cheney are taking place in January and February of 1854, her parents suggest this might be a great time for a wedding to occur because it seems that Mary Ann was heavy with child. <laughs> and so on February 24th, somewhat interrupting his know-nothing activities, he's married, one day later, he's in Bar Harbor conducting a rally there, and on April 1st, April Fool, uh, a son is born to the, for the, to the newlyweds, as it were, uh, 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 William Vernon uh, Cheney, as it were. <coughs> uh, ultimately, Cheney becomes dramatically involved in the Know Nothing movement, and it culminates in October when Father John Baps comes to Ellsworth. Violence had broken out. The bishop in Boston and the, uh, the leader of the Jesuit Society in Maryland had transferred Baps to Bangor, where there was a vacancy at St. Michael's Church, but just to protect him because it was so violent in Ellsworth. But he came back in October to visit his former friends, but also to go to Cherryfield, about 30 miles beyond, where he had to provide religious services. And the culmination of it is on a rainy October 14th evening, the people with whom he's staying in Ellsworth. If you go down to Ellsworth, it's right near where the railroad station is, basically. Um, the cast iron band come up through a driving rainstorm, surround the house, demand to be inside because they know Babs is there, they claim the owner of the house, the Kent Irish immigrants say, no, he's not here at all. Say, we know he's there. So they go in, and basically the Kent family had led uh, Father Babs to the basement, a darkened basement, He's standing there. People looking around all over the house, you can try and add it to find him. You can imagine that his Babs down in the dark, hearing maybe 12, 14 people out of the hundred there, kind of walking through the house, and he's kind of looking up as the floor creaks and the light. When suddenly one of the people said, hey, I was here helping to build this house last year. I remember this eight there's a basement down there and a trap door in the kitchen. They go down and haul him out. And basically, over the next two hours, he's hauled away through the driving rain. He's ridden on a rail. The rail snaps. He's then broke, burnt down to the river, where uh, basically he's tarred and feathered. A local woman provided some of the feathers locally. He's beaten, and they basically say, you must leave Ellsworth or in half an hour, or else we will kill you. Or, or other serious damage. He says, sure, sure. But by that point, the Irish community is out looking for him. They, they find him nursing back. 
trying to provide him food, but he's demanding to be able to offer the mass, the fall uh, corporate as one of the on the board of trustees there. He came to Ellsworth to present the case against at least the estimate is two to fifteen people um, in, up in the up in the Maine versus George W. Maddox et al. And so you pretty much know who one of them is. The point of the matter was there were 16 members of the grand jury, 17 actually, a fallback. To gain an indictment, you had to have 12 of the 16 vote in favor. Rumors were that of the 16 people on the grand jury for Hancock County, nine were members of the Know Nothings. And when apparently the vote on each one of the 50, the attorney general saying, this is one of the strongest cases I've got. You can imagine people in the Kent family had seen a lot of the people come in and bats, came back for the, for the investigation and uh, with, with police guards, as a number of you know in history studies. In 1855, about six or seven months later, the Republican Party starts. It drew a lot of abolitionists and other figures, former Whigs, but it also drew a certain number of nativists. And the point of the matter was Cheney was a true believer. He's still spouting on about the concern with limiting Irish Catholic immigration, with trying to make sure the Protestant faith is very important, very much determined to try to end, end immigration and other matters. But most of the people had moved on to deal with an, the anti-slavery issue, taking the starch out of some of these other movements away. Cheney basically in 1855 sees the support for his newspaper go down. Note significantly, in 1855, he changes the name of his paper from the Ellsworth Herald to the name by which it's even known today, the Ellsworth American. The Ellsworth American, as you may know today, is considered one of the great weekly newspapers in the Northeast, at least, if not in America. And the point of the matter was, by changing the name to the American, the American Party was the political arm of the Know Nothing movement. So if you will, the Ellsworth American was really a party newspaper of the, of the Know Nothing movement. Cheney then, in 1856, his paper collapses. He's invited to go to New Bedford, Mass. And over the next three or four years, he goes from one newspaper to another with very little success, struggling enterprises. His wife, Mary Ann, gives birth to a daughter in early 1858, in January. And suddenly, with no evidence for it, in May, the baby of three and a half months dies. I don't know if it's SIDS or something like that, but, but with no prior evidence of that, they go to Boston where he tries another newspaper. And again, it fails. He sends his wife and Willie back to Ellsworth to live with her parents. He remains in Ellsworth, in Boston, trying to struggle forward. Eventually, when she's sent back, she's four months pregnant with their third child, who eventually becomes Harry. Basically, in 1864, after four years, she divorces him for abandonment. Cheney, from 1860 to 65, originally is a ma matchmaker, not socially a matchmaker, but literally a matchmaker in Boston. <laughs> he then goes to New York City where he writes dime novels of the time. He drifts into discussion and lecture groups and happens to run into a figure named Luke Dennis Broughton. Luke Dennis Broughton, Dr. Broughton, was a graduate of the Philadelphia Eclectic Medical College, perhaps it's not quite Johns Hopkins, <laughs> but he is a true believing expert, say what you will, and one person won't, but in any event, he is, what, he is considered perhaps within the top three astrologers of the 19th century, a true believer and an expert in that. Cheney is writing a dime novel trying to show fortune tellers as frauds and the like. And so in all good appearances, he goes to uh, Dr. Broughton and says, I want to learn astrology. I'm dedicated to it. Actually, he just wants to learn the terms so he can write an effective book. And soon reveal, turn the tables on these frauds. But within a month, Cheney becomes dedicated to that. From 1866 to his death in 1903, 
Cheney becomes one of the leading astrologers in America. It is said that he taught more people astrology than anybody else in the 19th century in America. And it wasn't a con, because in, old, in, in later years, he sacrifices when he's living in poverty in St. Louis and in New Orleans and other areas. He pawns his overcoat so he has the money to be able to print the astrological treatises that he's doing. He really sacrifices for his craft, say what one will. And the point of the matter was basically in New York, he marries a, a third time, Mary Ann Brown, a English-born artist of significant quality. Her work is in the National Academy of Design and the like. For about two years, they live there, and then Cheney has the opportunity, with her approval, to travel west. Transcontinental Railroad's just built, just about the same May 19, 1869. Cheney goes west as part of a mining syndicate to claim mining stock for wealthy Easterners with the idea they're going to give him a small percentage. And it turns out he goes west, they go up toward Montana and the like, and the people that were selling these things basically ran away, took all their money. Cheney drifts westward, teaching astrology and an offshoot called astrotheology, namely the religious belief that all of the major religious major texts along with the major beliefs, are based on ancient people's, uh, ancient people's legends and writings. Okay, some say that anthropologically alike, but the, the distinctive part was the idea that these ancient writings were based on the movements of the planets. That every character in the Bible, in other words, was a planet or a, uh, or a constellation or something. So Cheney goes throughout the Pacific Northwest traveling from community to community for about three weeks in each community. He'll come into town and publish his basic ideas. I challenge anyone to debate me. See, they debate, you'll be able to split the proceeds. The local editor will say, this person seems to be presenting a bizarre idea, but it seems very plausible. He's very, very effective. And then, and then basically soon the, the, the tide turns against him and he moves on to the next place, as it were. Well, he comes to San Francisco and meets a, a elocutionist and pianist by the name of Flora Wellman, who had come from, the, from, the, uh, from uh, Massillon, Ohio. She's a piano player. She's one of the major spiritualists in the, in the San Francisco kind of swinging spiritualist society. <laughs> they live together for about 51 weeks. And in basically in June of 17, 1876, 55 years old, she is uh, some uh, born in 1843, so she will be 33. And she comes to tell him that she's uh, with child. You're gonna love it being a father. She <laughs> said, no, 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 no. Basically, uh, he says, it isn't mine, I don't believe in it, I'm, I'm impotent, no, all these kind of things to him. And basically, he boots her out of the house. Huge story in the San Francisco paper, this heart, this heavy-hearted, flint-hearted type of person. What a brute has kicked this pregnant lady out. You know, they're almost ready to lynch him, as it were. Cheney resumes his travels <laughs> and out of the, going back to Oregon and other places. So the point of the matter is, in January of, of 1876, <clears throat> some five months later, on January 14th in San Francisco, there is born John Cheney. <clears throat> Flora bestowing the name on the person she claimed to be the father. Some Eight months later, in September of 1876, she marries a person she became acquainted to in the intervening months named John London, an Iowa Army, uh, Army uh, soldier who had drifted west with two of his children, leaving the other nine back in Iowa, as it were. John, a veteran, rather physically uh, hurt by the war, he'd been wounded, uh, a noble uh, person, friendly but not physically strong, and unfortunate in business. 
they struggle over the next years, as it were. And, uh, and so, in, in basically, when they marry in September, John London gives his last name to the child, and so Jack London, John Griffith London, was born originally as John Cheney, so forth. Okay, we quickly move, not quick enough for you, but soon it's coming to end. <laughs> Recognize that under the, under the table here, the chief of the Portland police is basically giving me $5 a minute that I can keep you people off the streets of Portland. This is, this is all part of my design. I found my postgraduate career. Well, the gist of it is this. In 1897, Jack London is now 21 years old. He, having relatively little formal schooling, has become extremely determined to become a major novelist. Some of his step-siblings basically want to take him down a peg or two. And apparently, they broached to him the affair of the 1890s occurring. And he had gone there, he lived, he's now 76 years old, he's virtually blind, he's living in great poverty, living in really what was considered the worst red light district in the United States, as it was called, the time. And, and, and uh, uh, London writes two letters to him in June of 97, saying, are you my father? And asking about circumstances. And the letters don't survive, but, Cheney, uh, but Cheney's letters back to London do. Cheney had asked one of his friends, a Edward Applegarth, a friend of his, if he could use Applegarth's address so Flora wouldn't get all upset and all that the correspondence from, any correspondence from Cheney would come back to his friend. And the two letters, the kind of pathetic letters as London is trying to reach out to him, Cheney coldly basically says, I know nothing about this at all. It's truly, as biographers say, including the, the major Earl Labor biography just come out, uh, talks about basically uh, uh, the, the devastating effect it has on him. London will soon thereafter go to the Klondike and within two years starts his writing career, which lasts about 17 years, 1899 to 19. 16 when he dies in November, November 22nd. So that's where it is. London, fascinated by the ideas of what he hears of Cheney, wanting to know everything he can. He's come to believe that London, that Cheney is his father, his biological father. He tells his friend, he will tell his two young daughters, uh, Joan and, Bess and Becky, that that was the case. In the London papers at Berkeley, there is a 1909 letter, not of London, but a letter to London from one of his socialist friends from Heelberg, Oregon, where you can pretty much see what London was asking desperately, anything about Cheney. And, and, and this, this a writer indicated that he had studied astrology with Cheney. He knew him well. He was a fantastic guy. He would teach you anything. He was interested in math and all. In other words, as late as 1909, London is still fascinated with the idea of chaining. So, we go back in your desperation, it'll soon end, believe me, <laughs> uh, We go back to Ellsworth uh, Railroad Platform, December 16, 1905. When last we saw the Londons, they were on the railroad platform in Ellsworth, looking to see if Charmian's second cousin has shown up and didn't. <clears throat> uh, so basically, they go back on to the train, as it were. It was dark and bitterly cold on that Saturday afternoon when Jack and Charmian London and Manyungi boarded the Bangor-bound train in Ellsworth for the 30-mile trip north to the so-called Queen City of Maine for a five-hour layover. Then you would enjoy casual late supper before stepping up into the Pullman sleeping car just before midnight for their five hour overnight express to Boston. A busy lecturing schedule for London at Harvard and the Hub in general awaited the celebrated author before his party were planning to take an American fruit company steamer, the Admiral Farragut, 
to Jamaica on December 26th for a honeymoon break of two weeks before coming back to the last two weeks of his lecture tour. Jack London departed from Hancock County, Shire Town of Ellsworth, as he had entered it a week earlier, entirely oblivious to the presence in Ellsworth's Woodbine Cemetery, a mere two miles to the east of the railroad platform of the graves of his two deceased half-brothers, William and Harry, half-siblings of whose existence he had no knowledge at all. That one mile from the railroad track in the opposite direction down Main Street in Ellsworth, uh, lay, a, uh, lay a publisher's office in the nearby county courthouse, which both contained 50-year-old files of the Eastern Freeman, a weekly newspaper, the Ellsworth Herald, the Cheney been the editor, and the Ellsworth American. All of these papers that had prominently featured the actions of William Cheney, the antebellum central figure of Ellsworth, whom the young writer consistently believed was his biological father that scattered about the community of Ellsworth at the dawn of the 20th century were scores of elderly living men and women residents in their 60s and 70s who had personally known William Cheney and could have related details regarding Jack London's deceased parents' nature and past that London would have thirsted to learn. <coughs> and that the route that London's late afternoon train took out of Ellsworth followed virtually the identical path then in the opposite direction, Cheney had ridden a horse-drawn stagecoach some 53 years earlier, when the young attorney came to settle. Jack London left Ellsworth as he had found it, completely unaware that the very streets approaching the station platform, as well as the platform itself, rested upon ground on which had daily trod William Cheney more than two score years earlier. Had the California author known possessed by such a curiosity about his mysterious paternal link and driven by the remarkably tenacious and persistent qualities of the superb investigative reporter that he was, London would certainly have crossed the continent again to return to the downy shire town at least once more, this time for an extended and purposeful stay to discover all that he could find out about the man he believed to be his biological father. In short, although neither one of the couple realized it, Charmian was not the only London to have family connections with Ellsworth and Hancock County. Jack London's 1905 visit to Downey's Maine thus presented biographical di dimensions far more numerous involved and significant than the celebrated write writer ever knew or imagined, or indeed that local denizens ever realized either. Without provoking such far-ranging reflections, however, London's 535 Main Central passenger train started northward, down the tracks through the darkness of a cold winter afternoon in the Pine Tree State. Perhaps ghosts from the mid-19th century Ellsworth passed, the sort of spirits with whom Jack's mother Flora had regularly tried in unsettling seances to communicate, specters who in life had known the father and now observed the son, watched the dim lights of the rear car fade from view in the distance as the Bangor-bound train followed the track around a curve that carried the famous young author back from Hancock County to resume his customary role throughout mainline America as a national celebrity. So that's pretty much it. <laughs> It's a question, but I probably, I think Libby probably no, doesn't I'm, want to remain a formal presentation, you know, so, but I'm ready, ready to hang, but if anybody wants to know, or if anybody wants to know less, because I'm a know-nothing, but yes, ma'am. How long did it take you to put all those connections together? Well, about quarter after three. No. <laughs> oh, it's nothing. <laughs> My wife, I don't dare to say, because I know she's looking at me, but my wife will say, too awfully long. <laughs> but uh, but, uh, that, that, but, uh, but he, he's kind of a, a, a kind of a fascinating fellow, uh, as it were. And the people out in San Francisco, uh, it's very interesting, among the people at that Jack London Society thing last year was his great-great-granddaughter. And she was in tears, because the previous year, two years ago, when I went out to, we went out to uh, Logan, Utah, Utah State, 
uh, an early paper I have focuses on Jack London's half siblings, the people I talked about here. And, and she was just, she knew nothing about, no, see all the London people, they know nothing west of the Mississippi, east of the Mississippi River. You know, they, they believe it's just some sort of black hole out there. You know, kind of, you know. So just, you know, even without any person, devoid of personality, one still becomes a big deal because it's sort of like an odd, P.T. Barnum would be poor, you know, it seems to be, it, it almost gives the appearance of being able to, able to walk erect, you know, kind of thing. So, but, uh, in, in, anything else? I, Go on, you know, sure. Yeah. I don't really know how to phrase this, but um, is there, in Jack London's literature, is there any sort of presence of his lack of father or? You know, there, the, it, there, there are a couple of speculative uh, short stories he wrote. Remember, he writes 188. You know, he's enormously productive. If you think of it, he begins to write professionally when he's 23 years old, he's dead as a doornail at 40. And, you know, so in a 17 year career, he produces 53 books, you know, uh, 22 novels, uh, 12, uh, 12 basically nonfiction works. Uh, also, again, I'm just as a general thought, you know, in terms of we who are interested in history, history students could do, if you're studying the progressive period of life, there's a, an enormous amount of material you know, about London that, that still survives. But what, what I'm ultimately getting at is there are short stories where he deals with kind of characters who are bereft of, uh, of a parent. I should say one more thing. He and his wife enjoyed greatly being in Bowdoin. And so one of his short stories is, well, among them, and many are fascinating, but this is called The Enemy of All the World. And the character in an email block he makes as a graduate of Bowdoin. And he, he's an arch fiend. I mean, no, it's kind of interesting. It's written and not published in 1908. Uh, it talks about this figure who is bitter toward the whole world. And, and he develops this unusual power. It's almost uh, science fiction, developing an enormous way of, of just enormous explosions, such that, in, for example, it culminates in 1941. See if I could find an answer. I found a note where he mentioned the Alan Whitmore store door bicycle repair shop, and I thought maybe he was going to pursue that full time, but that didn't seem quite right. Then I remembered that he said he was a deputy custodian of the inexhaustible fount of all knowledge, and I thought maybe he had been promoted to chief custodian, which would take up more of his time. But then it dawned on me, knowing that the professor is a practical man and that Mrs. Whitmore wants to travel, I realized that he was leaving to pursue his secret passion to become a soldier of fortune. <laughs> I base this on the fact that I happen to know that he has in his possession at least one copy of Soldier of Fortune magazine. <laughs> but all kidding aside, though, on behalf of the thousands of students you've taught past 46 years at USM, thank you for being who you are and for being a great professor. You will truly be missed. Thanks, y'all, for coming out anyway.